Great things are rarely done alone. A special thank you to our 200th anniversary sponsors. Air Canada, Canadian Tire, Clearwater Seafoods, Lord Nelson Hotel and Suites, Michelin North America Canada Incorporated, Scotiabank, CBC, The Chronicle Herald and The Globe and Mail. We are proud to recognize our ongoing partnerships. Thank you for your generous support. Thank you and good evening. And welcome to Dalhousie University and to the inaugural Viola Desmond Legacy Lecture. And welcome to all those who are watching us through streaming. I am May Ann Francis, former Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia and distinguished. <laughs> Thank you. And distinguished public service fellow with the School of Public Administration here at Dalhousie. I am absolutely delighted to be part of tonight's important event. And I promise you, you're going to have a very special evening, and it's going to be spectacular. But before we get into the, um, the rest of the evening, I want to begin to ask Elder Jerry Muska LeBlanc to provide an opening blessing for us. Thank you, Elder Jerry. We have many very special guests with us this evening. The Honorable Tony Ince, Minister of African Nova Scotian Affairs and the Public Service Commission, and Le Lenora Zan, MLA, for Troll Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. They have joined us here this evening. We also have artists, filmmaker, and educated Educator Sylvia Hamilton, one of 52 Dalhousie Originals named this year, has joined us along with some of her students from University of King's College. And a group of 30 students from St. Francis Xavier University has traveled from Antikonish to be here. We also have many students and others from Dalhousie community with us as well. Welcome to all of you and to many others who have made it here tonight. This evening, we will award Dr. Angela Davis, a renowned social activist, author and professor, an honorary doctorate from Dalhousie University. You will also hear her. We will also hear her thoughts on the question, what will it take for us to create a world where we all feel like we truly belong? I know Dr. Davis has inspired and connected with many in our communities, and I know she has inspired me. And we are all very thrilled to welcome her here to Nova Scotia. We also have some very exciting performances in store for you tonight, but this event is special for another reason as well, as it serves as the launch of Dalhousie's Viola Desmond Legacy Lecture Series. which is a four-year series celebrating diversity and inclusiveness. The series takes its name from a very special African Nova Scotian woman. Viola Desmond was a hard-working entrepreneur with a dream and a vision for success. She was unique because she was a successful black businesswoman during a time when race relations in this province were dismal. On November the 8th, 
1946. Viola's life and the course of race relations in Nova Scotia were changed. On her way to Cape Breton to expand her business, Viola's car experienced mechanical problems in New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. It would take several hours to repair her vehicle, so she decided to go to the movies. Because she sat in the whites-only section in the Roseland Theater, she was arrested and thrown into jail. It cost more to sit in the white section, but the clerk would not accept her money to pay the difference in price. Subsequently, she was convicted of tax evasion of one cent. Viola and her followers fought this wrongful conviction in the courts to no avail. Viola's heroic actions and fight for equality and respect exposed racism and injustice in this province. 64 years later, after her wrongful conviction, and on April the 15th, 2010, 35 years after her death, she died in 1965, the province of Nova Scotia issued an apology to Viola's family for her wrongful conviction. At the same ceremony, as Lieutenant Governor, I granted the Royal Prerogative of Mercy free pardon to Viola Desmond. That was a very emotional and moving time for me. And as we would say in the black community, I freed my sister. My actions represented the unwavering recognition of her innocence and wrongful conviction and righted a wrong that never should have happened. I remarked at the time that Viola's story will ensure her legacy lives on in legal journals, in newspapers, human rights research, in political debates, and in race relations studies. And soon, she will appear on the Canadian $10 bill the first African Canadian and the first woman, besides Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, to appear on a regularly circulating Canadian banknote. <laughs> think of that one cent, and then think of $9.99. This lecture series named in her honor will keep the important conversations on equity and race relations alive. I am also pleased to announce that tonight, Dalhousie has dedicated a permanent seat here in the front row center in Rebecca Cohn Auditorium in memory of Viola Desmond. A plaque commemorating her legacy will be placed on the seat. They say the seat will remain empty for tonight's event, but I say her spirit is in that seat tonight. <laughs> Champions such as Viola Desmond, African Nova Scotian Rose Fortune, a successful businesswoman and the first female police officer in Canada in the 1800s, she lived in Annapolis Royal. Rocky Jones, who fought for equality and justice, inspired so much change here in Nova Scotia, including the development of the Transition Year Program and the IBNM initiative here at Dalhousie. <laughs> I inducted Rocky into the Order of Nova Scotia in 2010 for his work as human rights crusader. And who can forget Rosa Parks, who in 1955 
refused to give up her seat on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. And here with us tonight is Dr. Angela Davis. So there is a long list of male and female success stories in their quest for justice and equality. Many of us stand on their shoulders and we give them thanks. And I digress here for a moment just to share with you when I was inducting Rocky into the Order of Nova Scotia, and as he stood before me, and I was given, placing the medal on him, and I said, Rocky, I'm very proud and so happy. And he put that smile on, and you know Rocky with that beautiful smile, and he smiled and he said, I'm so happy and I'm proud of you. He said, but I can't hug you. <laughs> and I said, not right now, but. <laughs> And in addition to the guest I mentioned earlier, we also have another very special person here with us tonight. And her name is Wanda Robson. <laughs> Wanda is the sister of Viola Desmond. And Wanda has traveled all the way from North Sydney, Cape Breton. I'm from Cape Breton as well from Whitney Pier. Um, <laughs> she traveled with her husband, Joe, just to be here with us this evening. So please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Wanda and her husband, Joe. So, now we have some very special performances, and I know you're saying, I wish you'd hurry up and get to it, right? <laughs> Just be patient. I know you're excited for our next guest, and in the early 1980s, four young women came together to sing protest music at an anti-Ku Klux Klan rally here in Halifax, and they're still young. Inspired by a woman's a cappella group in the United States called Sweet Honey in the Rock, for the moment created their own captivating a cappella music, which took them from across the country to around the world, where they performed in venues such as Toronto's Roy Thompson Hall, Ottawa's National Arts Center, and New York's Lincoln Center. Their original compositions captured themes of women's struggles, African Nova Scotian history, human rights, and global social justice issues. For the moment has shared the stage with the likes of Peter Seeger, Buffy St. Marie, Richie Havens, and has opened for Dr. Maya Angelou not once, but on two separate occasions. The group's album recordings and documentary film Scores have won and received numerous awards, and despite retiring from the stage in 2001, for the moment's music and presence remains in great demand. Ironically, for the moment's debut concert performance took place on this very stage in October 1982 at a benefit concert to aid civil rights leaders in El Salvador. Tonight, these four distinguished civil rights leaders in their own right have reunited for this very special occasion to honor two fellow women civil rights leaders. Please join me in welcoming for the moment back to the stage and back to Rebecca Cohen. Hard times, black mother. 
her black daughter made it through some hard times. Black mother, black daughter. Made it through 
some hard times. Black mother, black daughter, made it through some hard times. Black mother, black daughter. so beautiful, just too beautiful, mm -hmm. so kind. We, we are just very, very humble and very honored to be a part of this celebration to pay tribute to two very amazing women in Dr. Angela Davis and our very own Viola Tesman. And we're just so happy to be a part of this and so grateful. And um, we're going to keep it going with the idea of women. Tote that barge, lift that bell. Don't you know why I can work like hell? Sound check, uh, MJ, who, if anyone has ever sang in this place, knows that she is like uh, a fixture who knows this place inside out. <laughs> she's a stage manager, she's got all the skills, and uh, she said, You're back again, I thought you retired. <laughs> <laughs> but we did perform here since retiring uh, on two occasions once when the Nova Scotia Mass Choir was doing a tribute to the group, and so they made us sing for our supper. <laughs> And uh, under the leadership of Shantae Grant, and uh, when our dear brother, uh, comrade, civil rights leader, Dr. Rocky Jones passed, and of course the memorial was held here. So we're feeling like Muhammad Ali a little bit tonight, uh, <laughs> coming out of retirement so many times. Uh, well, three, three. Please, please, charm. 
And uh, anything, you can stand up here and look out and see how beautiful everybody looks yeah. from here. The look is really fun here. Yeah. So for those who have been a part of the For The Moment journey, you know that this next song could go on forever, but we have respect. We're going to shorten it up tonight. <laughs> Our very good comrade and mentor to many here in Nova Scotia, Dr. Malafia Sante, said, whatever you do, you must have a consciousness of victory. So as we open up spaces so that we all belong, as we do this work uh, here to Dalhousie and beyond, uh, we must be very, very optimistic and have a consciousness of victory that we will win and we, everyone will feel like they belong and all that we do. So we thank Dahlzi for this, and we uh, tribute them for having this night. In my soul, 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 I know we will come through. Oh, in my soul. In my soul, oh, in my soul, in my soul, in my soul, in my soul, I know we will come through. We'll come through tribulations of a pocket steep and bare. We'll come through trials of poverty so loud. We'll wait the dead, and we shall not be silenced by slurs that hold no truth. For dignity, he holds the soul, and I know we will come. Oh, in my soul, 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 in my soul I know we will come through. Oh, in my soul, in my soul, yeah, in my soul, in my soul, in my soul, in my soul I know we will come through. Oh, I know we will come. I know, I know we will come through. And if we had more time, we'd teach you how to say this in a language from another country. And it says, Embedded me to Kirivu Momo Yo, which means we will come through. So I didn't get a chance to teach you, but we're going to do it anyway. Embedded me to Kirivu Momo Yo. Embedded me to Kirivu Momo Yo. Embedded in the two Kirivu Mamoyo. I know we will come through. Embedded oh, in the two Kirivu Mamoyo. Oh, oh, yeah. In the two Kirivu Mamoyo. Embedded in the two Kirivu Mamoyo. I know we will come through. Embedded in the two Kirivu Mamoyo. Embedded in the two Kirivu Oh Lord, I know we will come through him better to my soul, my Oh Lord, I know we will come through him better to my soul, my Oh Lord, I know we will come through him better to give my We're gonna come through. I know we will come through. Keep the consciousness of victory at all times. Thank you. We love you.
I know you would like that to have gone on a little bit longer. Now, did that take you back some, to some good days? Yeah. Thank you so much, Delvinda Bernard, Kimberly Bernard, Andre Cur um, Curie, and Anne Marie Woods. What a pleasure it was to hear you again. Thank you so much. Let's give them another round of applause. I am pleased now to welcome to the stage the Honorable A. N. McClellan, Chancellor, Dalhousie University, President and Vice Chancellor, Dr. Richard Florizone, Chair of the Senate, Dr. Kevin Hewitt, as well as Wanda Robson, sister of Viola Robson, Viola Desmond, Before I bring out our, our, our guest of honor, I just want to tell you a little story about um, wonderful Wanda Robson when they were unveiling the $10 bill and she had one in her hand and of course she was not giving it back to the minister, it didn't matter. <laughs> and because um, it's not in circulation towards the end, of the end of the year and I said, could I have it? And she said, I like you but not that much. <laughs> so anyways, there you go. Now, our very special guest of honor, Dr. Angela Davis. Good evening. Please be seated. We'll have time for much more applause. Thank you all, friends, for being here this evening. Um, first off, to begin, a special thank you to our great friend and Dalhousian, our former Lieutenant Governor, Dr. Francis. We, um, let me say, Dr. Francis, Mayan, we're so thrilled to have you here with us as part of this spectacular event. Um, you are an inspiration to us for so many reasons. Uh, for those who don't know, Dr. Francis was the first African Nova Scotian to serve as Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia, and she was also the first employment equity officer here at Dalhousie, and those are just two of her firsts. She was the first black woman to serve as Assistant Deputy Minister to the Ontario Women's Directorate, the first woman to hold the position of Nova Scotia Provincial Ombudsman, and the first African Nova Scotian woman to serve as Director and CEO of the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission. Wow. wow. And to cap it off, let me just say, as president of Dow, we were so proud, uh, Dr. Francis, when you joined us in 2015 in our School of Public Administration as our first distinguished public service fellow, one final smaller first. So thank you, Dr. Francis, for sharing tonight with us. Um, it's wonderful for all of you to be here uh, as we host our inaugural Viola Desmond Legacy Lecture and bestow an honorary degree on Dr. Angela Davis. 2018 is a special year for Dalhousie as we reflect on our university's journey so far and look towards our third century, the road ahead. Our 200th year has been filled with events, programs, and performances from across all of our faculties and campuses in the community and even across the country as part of our Coast to Coast alumni tour, which just wrapped up. And the response has been phenomenal. 
Uh, we've had more than 14,000 people participate in our 200th events, and there's still more to come. The year's not over yet. From the beginning, Dalhousie has aspired to the highest academic, academic standards and to be of service to our communities. Two centuries later, we've grown from what was a little college by the sea into a national university and the top research university in Atlantic Canada. But we wouldn't be here today without our people. Our history has been written by our people and enriched by their identities, their cultures, their values, actions, their teaching and scholarship. And we stand here tonight on the shoulders of African Nova Scotians. Through enslavement and as free people overcoming centuries of segregation and racism, African Nova Scotians have helped build this province from as early as the 1600s. And this evening, as part of our 200th, specifically acknowledges the outstanding contributions of all people of African descent at Dalhousie, whether African Nova Scotian, from across Canada, or throughout the African diaspora. Now, as many of you know, in 2013, the UN proclaimed 2015 through 2024 as the international decade for people of African descent. Dalhousie University is proud to join the government of Nova Scotia, Canada, and other countries in officially proclaiming that decade, which provides a framework. <laughs> it provides a framework for the protection of the human rights and fundamental freedoms of people of African descent. It also encourages greater knowledge of and respect for the diverse heritage, culture, and contributions of African-centered communities across the world. Last fall, in fact, a UN report identified the distinctiveness of African Nova Scotians and their contribution here. We recognize African Nova Scotians as a distinct people and acknowledge how they have shaped this province and university literally over centuries. We celebrate the contributions of all people of African descent and value the integral role they play in our communities. We also understand that we must learn from our past in order to create a truly equitable institution and community today and for future generations. So on behalf of Dalhousie University, I do hereby proclaim the United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent at Dalhousie University and will take action to support the decade's theme of recognition, justice, and development. The full text, thank you. The full text of that proclamation is included in your program. African Nova Scotians have persevered despite uh, many challenges, including the attitudes and actions of some of the people associated with, with this university. And that's being examined by the Lord Dalhousie Scholarly Panel on Slavery and Race. I want to assure you that Dalhousie is committed to strengthening our relationship with these important communities, also through the development of an African Nova Scotian strategy that is part of our larger commitment to diversity and inclusion. And I'm pleased to report that this strategy is well underway. This is a critical step on the path forward for our university. As we enter our third century at Dow, we are more committed than ever to creating an environment in which all members of our community, including all peoples of African descent, feel welcome, supported, and respected. All year, as part of this Belong Forum series, we've been asking this important question. What would it take to create a world where all feel like we truly belong. Now this evening, Dr. Davis will share her wisdom by addressing that very question. And I can't wait to hear what she has to say. But first, some formalities. Conferring an honorary doctoral degree is the highest honor a university bestows. And I now call upon Dr. Kevin Hewitt, Chair of Dalhousie Senate, to present the candidate for the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. Welcome, Dr. Hewitt. Dr. Davis, can you please rise? It is my distinct, distinct honor and pleasure to describe to you some of the outstanding accomplishments uh, of Dr. Angela Yvonne Davis 
accomplishments that are well known to all of you. For more than six decades, Dr. Angela Davis has offered us a living example of resistance to oppression on the basis of race, sex, and class. She is a champion for global solidarity in the face of what can feel like insurmountable obstacles to social justice. Recognized around the world as an influential educator and scholar, prolific author, political activist, and thought leader, Dr. Davis has challenged and shaped our understanding of so many different subjects, feminisms, feminism, African American studies, gender and racial equality, Marxism, social consciousness, incarceration. We are proud to present her with an honorary degree today. Born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama in the 1940s, Dr. Davis attended a segregated elementary school and went to high school in New York. She earned a BA in 1965 from Brandeis University in Massachusetts, a master's degree in 1968 from the University of California, San Diego, and a PhD in philosophy from Humboldt University. Her activism includes involvement in the Black Power Movement of the 60s and of course membership in the Black Panther Party. Dr. Davis was, as you may all know, removed from her teaching position at UCLA because of her social activism and membership in the Communist Party. She has put her career and her life on the line for her beliefs, spending time on the FBI's 10 most wanted list and <laughs> and 16 months in prison following her involvement in the case of the Soldad Brothers. She was exonerated in 1972. With, <laughs> with the help of the Free Angela Davis campaign, a campaign that also resulted in the recording of at least six popular songs about her by the likes of the Rolling Stones and John Lennon and Yoko Ono. A strong and powerful voice for women and for black women in particular. Dr. Davis stood among the giants of the civil rights movement. Excuse me. and was instrumental in waking us up to how race, sex, and class intersect to systematically oppress so many in our society, work that is still critical today. Political activism, of course, remains central to Dr. Davis's life and work. She was honorary co-chair of the Women's March on Washington in 2017 is an active <laughs> is an active supporter of the Black Lives Matter movement and <laughs> and works internationally for prison abolition.
Dr. Davis has served as Professor of Ethnic Studies at San Francisco State University and Professor in the History of Consciousness and the Feminist Studies Department at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Since 2008, she has been Distinguished Professor Emerita at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She's also the recipient of many prestigious awards and honors, including the American Book Award, the Thomas Merton Center Award, the Black Girls Rock Icon Award, <laughs> the Sackler Center First Award, and an honorary doctorate from the California Institute of Integral Studies in 2016. It is fitting for Dr. Davis to bring her message to today's Belong Forum, a message that exhorts us not to give up hope in difficult and confusing times. During a speech at Brown University last year, she urged young student activists to keep fighting, saying, quote, this is the only time in your lives where the work that you're doing is thinking and reading and discussing, and you have the opportunity at this historical moment to translate some of that into activism, unquote. I would now like to, at this point, invite uh, Wanda Robson, to present Dr. Davis with a kente sash, and I can help with that. And one final uh, sentence here. <laughs> In recognition um, of her steadfast activism, brilliant scholarship, and outspoken commitment to social justice, I ask you, Madam Chancellor, in the name of the Senate, to bestow upon Dr. Angela Davis the degree of Doctor of Laws honoris causa. Ladies and gentlemen, there are a few words I have to say to make this all official. <laughs> Angela Davis, by virtue of the authority vested in me and in Dalhousie University, I admit you to the degree of Doctor of Laws honoris causa with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities appertaining thereto. Congratulations, Dr. Davis. <laughs>
Congratulations, Dr. Davis. Well deserved. What an honor, what an honor to stand here and for all of you to witness this historic occasion. It's just amazing. And I think if somebody had said to me way back when that someday you're going to meet Angela Davis, I would have said, I don't think so. <laughs> One never knows. Next, I want to welcome to the stage one of our most powerful African Nova Scotian voices and a friend of mine, Shante Grant. <laughs> Shante is a professor, poet, and author. And Shante's latest children's book, Africville, is nominated for the Governor General's Award. Shante is here to perform two spoken word pieces, Rising Star, Rini Smith, and two of her siblings will join Shante on stage along with Wayne Hamilton and Silvio Pupo. Good evening. <laughs> it's an honor to be here this evening and to be part of this event. Um, and uh, I'm not going to give a long intro because I, let's just get right to the poetry. This piece takes its title from an African proverb. Until lions have historians, hunters will be heroes. She looked like Nefetari, with the strength of Ya Sanswa. A mind like Makeda, warrior style like Nzinga, she a singer, an ancient songstress of the sun. A songwriter who marries rhythms with folklore, a complex chorus incantation while libation she would pour, an invocation for ancestral rapport. From miles away he heard her, and he lusted for her core. She wore a cloak of many colors, full-figured and dark-skinned. She bore babies that laid the foundation for world thought. Griot, historian, philosophers, forward thinkers and inventors, mentors for physicians, bush teas and remedies passed down for centuries remain connected to the root of her soil. She labored and toiled and tilled the earth to give birth to prayers and proverbs, encrypted hieroglyphic scriptures scribbled in the sand, amethyst jewels bedecked her hand, gold and other precious stones. She owned the throne of humanity, for no other nation could be built without the root of she. Was a queen, to say the least. Her frame, an aromatic feast that smelled of pepper, oil, and spices. Ground nuts, stew, and pounded yam made with love like touch and kiss. He found it impossible to resist her natural beauty, her sounds, her sights. They stirred his senses. And so viciously aroused, he crossed turbulent waters just to browse. And she, so loving like a mother, welcomed him with open arms, tucked coconuts inside her palms. She gave him eat and gave him rest between the mangoes of her breast. And while he suckled like a child and drank the juice her rivers gave, he hatched a plot to rape, impregnate, and turn her children into slaves. He kissed her just so he could bite her, hugged her close to break her bones, raised a flag to slay her spirits, plopped his ass upon her throne, stole her natural resources, raised his kingdoms overseas, 400 years of steady screw and left her plagued with STDs. Still today, he stands above her, dodging blame for blemishes, a blatant rapist, faking lover, tossing alms to feed her kids, young fruit ripe with aspiration, trying to brave a deadly truth, would-be saviors turned cold killers, murder mama in their youth. And yes, daughters have betrayed her, she got sons that pimped her ass. She upheld oppressive systems in the not too distant past. She owned slaves and sold her children to the demons at her door. And she engaged in social terror, birthing blood and guts and war. Thus, the history of the lion. Complicated as it may, 
a vortex of rival forces, a, a pendulum in constant sway. And you may criticize her construct, but take heed to what you say, because the fact is that she's owed a debt we can't begin to pay. The fact is that she's owed a debt we can't begin to pay. The fact is that she's owed a debt we can't begin to pay. The fact is that she's owed a debt we can't begin to pay. The fact is that she's owed a debt we can't begin to pay. Until lions have historians, hunters will be heroes. Um, one thing I've realized on my storytelling journey is that there's more than one way to tell a story. There are multiple sides to the truth. Um, and throughout our history, our shared history as human beings on this planet, some truths have gone unspoken. But in this, uh, this year of belonging, at this particular moment in time, I've been thinking a lot about these unspoken truths, the questions that have gone unanswered, the stories that have never been told. And especially, I've been wondering, what can I do to change or to expand the narrative? The question of this belong form is, what would it take to create a world where we all feel like we truly belong. And so I'm asking, how can we create that world? How can we bring about that change in the world, in our communities, and in our own lives? i 
take a minute and just sit with that question um, and I invite you if you wish to close your eyes with me um, and just think about that what would it take to create a world where we all feel like we truly belong and how can we bring about that change in the world in our communities and in our lives take to create a world where we all feel like we truly belong? And how can we be that change? Affect that change? So I wasn't kidding when I said we were in for a very powerful evening tonight. Thank you so much, Shante and Rini and Micah and Mahalia, Wayne and Silvio for that wonderful music, inspiring words to make us think. Now for the moment that we've been waiting for, I'm pleased to welcome back to the stage Dr. Angela. Davis, please welcome her. With a warm Nova Scotia welcome. First of all, I would like to thank the Mi'kmaq people on whose ancestral and unceded territory this university is located. <laughs> I thank Dalhousie University, the Chancellor, the President, the President of the Senate, for offering me an honorary de 
degree this evening and for having invited me to speak. This has been a wonderful evening, um, an evening of song and, and, and culture. So I would also like to thank the group for the moment for reconvening uh, uh, and providing us with you know, such uh, rich sounds this evening. And Shante Grant and her friends. <laughs> and I really would like to thank Wanda Robson for being here this evening. <laughs> and your sister, Viola Desmond. I am deeply honored to have been included in the, the long forum that celebrates the 200th anniversary of Dalhousie University and, as you've heard many times already, asks the question, what would it take to create a world where we all feel like we truly belong? And I understand that this is also the inaugural Viola Desmond Lecture Series. Uh, um, and uh, I, um, I suppose that the theme reflects you know, what she was fighting for when she um, refused to be segregated in the black section of the theater. And I can tell you that uh, learning about her act um, many, many years ago uh, reminded me of the many times in which my friends and I were forced to sit in segregated sections of movie theaters in the most segregated city in North America, Birmingham, Alabama. I want to thank you for formulating that question of belonging in that way because it implies that the society must transform, it must change in order to include those who have been relegated to the margins. Other conceptualizations simply ask how to achieve diversity and inclusion without attending to the transformations uh, that would be necessary in order to achieve justice. Should black people want to be included in a society that remains just as racist as it was before they were invited to join? Should Muslims want to be included in a society that remains Islamophobic? Should women be invited into a world that remains as sexist and misogynist as before? <coughs> Should disabled people be embraced by a society that continues to perpetuate its ableist ideologies and practices. And of course, we could formulate the question uh, uh, with many other terms. But before I begin to explore the overarching question of this um, Belong Forum, I want to um, um, tell you how I learned about um, the legacy of uh, Viola Desmond, whose image, I understand, will be the first um, woman alone, aside from Queen Elizabeth, and the first black person on the Canadian dollar. And I'm not sure how I feel about that. Um, <laughs> but um, it is also possible to embrace contradictions. I would rather abolish the money economy. <laughs> I 
But I want to tell you that I first heard about Viola Desmond from Faith Nolan many years ago. And I also learned about Af Africville when I heard of Faith's album, which is entitled Africville, and that must have been in the 1980s. Uh, but this is the very first time I've had the opportunity to visit Halifax. Uh, and I am very appreciative of the occasion to finally visit this city with its very rich history as the site of one of the first settlements of free Africans outside of Africa, as the site of resistance and struggle from Viola Desmond to Rocky and Joan Jones to those who are continuing to fight for a better world today. What would it take to create a world where we all feel like we truly belong? We might first look at those who have been officially ostracized from society. The more than 10 million people who are in prison throughout the world. People who are in prison, whether they committed reprehensible harms against other human beings, whether they committed minor acts against property, whether they are behind bars because they never had significant opportunities to learn, to receive mental health care, to live in decent housing, etc. People who are in prison have been designated as those who are divested of basic civil rights. They have been deprived of civil life and thus effectively relegated to a place of civil death. It makes sense to begin here where we confront the work of ideological exclusion in the most literal sense, where this process of exclusion is too often represented as absolutely necessary to the survival of civil life. It is behind jail and prison walls that we discover the worst modes of violence, officially condoned state violence, violence linked to the disciplinary process, gender violence promoted by the institution against men, against women, against trans and gender non-conforming prisoners, violence against the body, violence against the mind, violence against the spirit. This violence is never entirely contained by prison walls, but rather exists in a symbiotic relation with violences in the larger society. It is not accidental that in jails and prisons all over the world, there are disproportionate numbers of black people, brown people, indigenous people, people from the global south. It is in this context that I want to acknowledge the prison strike that took place in the United States and also here in the province of Nova Scotia. <laughs> the prison strike that took place this past August 21st. You have to excuse me, I'm recovering from a cold. Does that one stay here? Oops. No. <laughs> the prison strike that took place this past August and September from, from August 21st 
the anniversary of the assassination of George Jackson by San Quentin guards in 1971 to September 9th, the anniversary of the outbreak of the, the uprising in Attica prison in 1971. The prisoners had 10 demands. The first was for, and I'm quoting, immediate improvements in prison conditions and for prison policies that recognize the humanity, the humanity of imprisoned men and women. And if you examine the demands, you see that this theme of demanding that that prisoners be recognized as humans, as human beings. Uh, uh, that theme can be discovered throughout the 10 demands. The last demand called for an end to felony disenfranchisement. Uh, and I think you uh, understand that, especially in the United States, this has been a major issue, uh, uh, particularly since the election of George W. Bush uh, that was uh, enabled uh, by the exclusion of former prisoners uh, from the voters' role. Uh, uh, but you know, from the vantage point of uh, the present, uh, George W. Bush, uh, <laughs> I mean, I never thought I would say this. <laughs> but, well, I won't say it, so you understand what I'm trying to say. <laughs> but I understand that prisoners here in Burnside Jail under the leadership of Randolph Riley and others, joined the strike that claimed coast-to-coast -coast participation in the U.S. And I also understand that uh, some of Randolph's family and church members may be present this evening. Am I correct? I can't see the audience, so, oh, there you, yes. Uh, well, I want us to I want us to applaud Randolph Riley for his courageous work. I also want to acknowledge the work of Robin Maynard, who has written a powerful study of state violence in Canada. It is entitled, of course, many of you have read it. Those of you who haven't read it, uh, you should read Policing Black Lives, State Violence in Canada from Slavery to the Present. This book not only helps us to develop perspectives on state violence in Canada, but it can help people in the US and elsewhere to think more capaciously about the violent and too often unchallenged work of the state, including what Maynard calls slavery's afterlife in the child welfare system. And to quote um, another section of her book, over-policed and under-protected, how state violence maintains black women's structural vulnerability to abuse and exploitation. Robin Maynard's book, which focuses precisely on those who have been forcibly excluded from a sense of belonging, helps us to understand where one might begin, not only in Canada, but in the US as well. Her book highlights the frequently unacknowledged predicament of women 
especially women of color, indigenous women, black women, immigrant women. It helps us to understand that if we ad address and try to begin to transform the conditions surrounding the lives of these groups of women, we move in the direction of the radical transformation of society. Maynard's book also gives special attention to transgender women. And she writes, and I quote, Though little data is available in Canada, in the first six months of 2016 in the United States, more than 10 black trans women have been killed, including Sky Maccabee, Daniqua Dodds, and Dee Wiggum. Gender oppression extends well beyond the male-female gender binary, intersex, non-binary and gender non-conforming people, while not identifying as women, experience important and underdocumented marginalizations that often go unseen in anti-racism efforts, which focus solely on the experiences of young black men. I have found another volume which focuses on the US and Canada quite edifying. It is entitled, and it was published a number of years ago, Disability Incarcerated, Imprisonment and Disability in the United States and Canada. Uh, if you're interested in reading it, it is edited by Liat Ben Moshe, um, Chris Chapman, and Alison Carey. This perspective is a much needed one if we are to imagine transformed, just and inclusive communities. The marginalization and incarceration of the physically and mentally disabled has had a profound impact on our societies. From the ableist ideology that normalizes ableism and assumes that disabilities are defects and reasons for relegating people with disabilities to an inferior status in society, to the violence that is inflicted on people with disabilities in schools and prisons and other institutions. And yes, by the way, our language is so full of ableist metaphors that we're not even aware when we use the words blind, deaf, crippled, insane, crazy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And since I've been suggesting reading, uh, <laughs> I remember reading uh, quite a number of years ago an article um, uh, by Vivian May and Beth Ferry that's called Fixated on Ability questioning ableist metaphors and feminist theories of resistance. Uh, and this is important because often, even when we think we are resisting, even when we think we are moving forward, we end up replicating the very ideologies that stabilize notions of what counts as normal. The use of these metaphors helped to, helps to consolidate our sense of what counts as normal. And of course, the normal becomes the standard for inclusion. One of the major problems with the prevailing notion of how to solve issues of racist, sexist, class-based exclusion is that it is assumed that the person to be integrated has to genuflect to the needs of the institution that has previously excluded them.
They have to be incorporated. They have to be embraced by the normal. They have to become normalized by being included. This is, this is precisely the problem with the way in which we generally understand diversity. And I should say that um, diversity largely emanates from the corporate realm. <laughs> diversity helps capitalism. And it, capitalism functions much better with the explicit assistance of those whom it originally expelled to the margins. <laughs> I am extremely concerned that in the US, your neighbor to the south. Our attention is being so deflected toward our specific domestic issues, especially given the conditions created by the election two years ago of a person who habitually engages in behavior, makes statements and calls for policies that are anti-immigrant and racist and misogynist and, and, and misogynist and jingoist and transphobic and xenophobic and ableist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If one were to use Donald Trump as a measure of the progress we have made <laughs> during his own lifetime, the result would be zero or perhaps even a negative number. And he still claims to want to go backwards to the days when America was great. And I suppose that means slavery. I suppose that means colonialism. I'm not suggesting that we ignore the predicament that has been created by the election of Donald Trump in the US, but rather that we not use it as a measure of how far we have come in our efforts to understand how to transform our worlds so that ever increasing numbers of people can feel that they belong. Here is a person who has called up the most regressive ideas and political practices that we can imagine, who has affirmed white nationalism, who assaults and belittles women, who call African countries shithole countries. What a nightmare. The point that I'm making is that we cannot sink to his level in the course of trying to challenge him. That would be to misrecognize the important progress we have made. We've come to understand that ending racism is not simply about wishing it away. It is not about legislating it away. It is not simply about psychologizing it away. And of course, it is not simply about including those who have been previously pushed to the margins. If we have advanced in our thinking about racism, it is that we now recognize the deep structural character of racism how deeply entrenched it is in all of our institutions. And likewise, we are beginning, I think, to recognize the structural character of misogynist violence. Uh, and I would suggest that we can certainly learn lessons from the 
you know, ongoing struggles against racism. Uh, this period in which we are acknowledging, finally, acknowledging gender violence as the most pandemic form of violence in the world. In this period, however, there is still the tendency to assume that it emanates from bad men. That if somehow we can identify you know, all of the men who have these horrible proclivities, uh, uh, then we would solve that problem. Uh, but it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Um, men who commit such acts, uh, many of them are good men. You know, they're judges. <laughs> and they are prominent celebrities, actors. Uh, uh, and I think you uh, get the reference here. Uh, um, but I want to um, uh, suggest that um, the, the theory and practice of evolution provides some lessons. Um, not only with respect to the potential eradication of structural racism, uh, but also with respect to the potential eradication of gender violence. When we first raised the call of abolition, there were those who argued that Precisely at a time when we had just succeeded in making domestic violence and sexual assault crimes, we were calling for the abolition of the system that would make male purveyors of violence against women accountable. But is it not now time to reflect on more effective ways to rid the world of gender violence and other products of toxic masculinities? Uh, and when I say toxic masculinities, I am um, referring to a, a phenomenon um, that is ideological. Uh, and it also means that people gendered as females can be purveyors of these toxic masculinities. But the question is, and this is actually a version of the question that is the overarching theme of this Belong Forum, the question is how can we envision a world in which violence against women is no longer the most pandemic form of violence on the planet. Carceral feminism is a term that has emerged to refer to a feminism that relies on criminalization, a feminism that assists in the buildup of prisons, and that even if inadvertently bolsters the structural racism that is most dramatically seen in the prisons of the world which hold a disproportionate number of black and Latinx and indigenous uh, people and people from the global south. If we cannot rely on criminalization, it means that society itself has to be changed. And the question becomes, how can we imagine a world in which 
um, gender violence no longer routinely takes place uh, because uh, precisely the reasons for uh, the um, relegation of women to places of inferiority throughout the society and in the home and inside relationships as well shall have been effectively addressed. But women cannot simply aspire to take the places of men. but rather must aspire toward radical transformation. If we simply want to become what white, straight, cis men in power have been in the past, we are replicating the structures that will continue to perpetuate the violence we are challenging. If we don't challenge the structures, if we don't challenge the very meaning of the hierarchies of power, it might be said that women are simply fighting for the right to be as violent as men. And I don't think that makes any sense. But this is why campaigns demanding the equality of women in the military should always be combined with a deep critique of the military itself. <laughs> this is why support for marriage equality with respect to LGBTQ communities should be combined with a radical critique of the institution of marriage which not only is grounded in capitalist notions of property inheritance, but also structurally harbors the very violence we oppose when we stand up against gender violence. Our work today is explicitly linked to struggles in other parts of the world. And so in the last portion of my remarks, I want to um, internationalize our uh, vision. I, I always try to include some reference to the struggle for justice in Palestine in my remarks. <laughs> Precisely because the Palestinian struggle has been so systematically represented and excluded even by those who consider themselves proponents of social justice. The 70th anniversary of the Nakba is being observed this year. It was in 1948 that hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were expelled from their homes and their land. Seven decades later, Palestinians are still struggling for justice. And the state of Israel continues to try to expand its power and control. Like the US, like Canada, Israel is a settler colonialist nation. The US and Canada forcibly took over the land of the aboriginal inhabitants. When we say that Israel is probably the only settler colonial nation that continues to try to expand in the 21st century, we are not indicting all of the citizens, and especially not all of the Jewish citizens of Israel. There is a difference between the state and the people, as we well know. As we well know in the US, and as people in Brazil certainly know. 
After having emerged in 1985 from an era of a repressive military dictatorship, Brazil has been involved in a slow trajectory toward and then away from democracy, from civilian leadership to more radical leadership of Lula and the Workers' Party to the coup against Dilma Rousseff and her replacement with Michael Timmer. And today, as Donald Trump's counterpart, uh, he seems to be spawning uh, his <laughs> counterparts in other parts of the world. Jair Bolsonaro, yes. as he gains support among regressive forces in Brazil, he makes openly racist, misogynist, and homophobic remarks. He has also joined Trump in dismissing uh, the importance of African countries. Uh, he calls immigrants from Haiti, Africa, and the Middle East the scum of humanity. And I, um, I mention uh, Brazil because Brazil has the largest black population outside of Nigeria. And you are reflecting on, on the plight, the contributions, the struggles of people of African descent uh, uh, here in this province. And so finally, let me conclude by saying that the hallmark of the most effective forms of activism today is what we often call intersectionality. The recognition of the intersections of struggles is central to feminist approaches that are anti-racist and anti-capitalist. We are not referring here to feminism as a special interest, uh, um, but rather as an emancipatory strategy for people of all racial, gender, sexual backgrounds. I'm referring to an abolition feminism, an abolition feminism defined by radical women of color. A feminism that recognizes that water is a human right. <laughs> From Flint, Michigan, to Standing Rock, to Kenya, to the shooting of Palestinian water tanks by the Israeli military. A feminism that recognizes that struggles against xenophobia and especially in the US against the incarceration of undocumented people advance our abolitionist campaign to end the prison industrial complex more broadly. This is an anti-racist, anti-imperialist, radical socialist practice that calls for the kind of democracy that can move us toward a society that is truly inclusive, a society that is just, a society that represents the future of our dreams. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davis. By way of self-introduction, let me say my name is Paul Kennedy. I'm the host of a program. <laughs> I'm the host of a program called Ideas on CBC Radio. And I guess with the power invested in me as host of that program, I would like to confer an honorary doctorate of ideas <laughs> on Angela Davis. 
And let me say there's no place on earth I would rather be than right here, right now. It's my great privilege to be here uh, to congratulate Dalhousie on its 200th anniversary and to congratulate Dalhousie on its brilliance in choosing this person for an honorary doctorate. <laughs> Amazing. I, I now have the uh, somewhat dubious honor of having a question period which is limited in time, unfortunately. And so I'll read the rule book from the beginning. There are, I believe, microphones in the aisles. Uh, and people, there are none in the balcony, I understand. So if there are questions from the balcony, people will have to come down and, and uh, come to the microphones on the floor. Uh, and due to the spirit of belonging, uh, we will, I think, begin with questions with people from Nova Scotia of African heritage, not just of Nova, <laughs> yes. and not just in, in the spirit of internationalism as well, spirit from the African diaspora, uh, people who are here from not just Nova Scotia, from other places. So if uh, there are people at the microphones, I, I, uh, I can see one here, and I believe there might one. Please, ma'am, question. I'd like to first thank you so much for your words. Uh, it was an honor to be able to sit here with you for the second time. I was able to listen to you once in the UK this past year, and it's always been amazing. Uh, my name is Jade Tynes. I'm African Nova Scotian. My last names are Tynes, Simmons, Kelsey, and States. If you're Scotian, you know what that means. <laughs> and I want to first welcome you here for, uh, with regards to, to all of us. Uh, my question for you is with regards to storytelling. As a journalist, as a CBC reporter, and as a producer for television, I think story is a really important mechanism to create change. And I want to know from you, what type of advice would you give a young person who is trying to create stories that not only inform, but promote and engage people to take action? Hmm. Well, I suppose um, I would say don't be afraid to tell the story. Don't be afraid to tell your story. And um, um, journalists play an important role. Um, even in this era of social media, they tend to mediate what we recognize as truth. And I say that with scare quotes. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, precisely because, um, you know, given uh, the the words of uh, Donald Trump, uh, there are those who uh, counter his uh, alternate facts with a call for the real facts. And I don't know if facts matter as much as the perspective which the the framework which allows us to understand those facts. And that framework, I think, is um, a framework of um, critical thinking. And I'm not talking about the critical thinking courses that you take as a matter <laughs> of course. I'm talking about uh, a practice of learning how to ask questions of learning how to question everything, learning that nothing is immune to question. Even, even those categories that we use to formulate our questions have to be questioned. And I think that is the, that is the work of the teacher uh, to, I always tell my students, you know, I'm not really inter interested in how much information you have. You know, information is so easily available. You know, if you have, if you have one of, you know, these small devices right here, you have information at your fingertips. I'm interested in, 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 in the way in which you ask questions about what is presented as the truth. Uh, 
And so I would, um, I guess my advice would be uh, to tell the stories in such a way that invites um, those who listen to those stories to ask questions about their own lives and the conditions surrounding their lives. Good evening, Dr. Davis. I'm so happy to be able to be here today and to listen to the words you have to say. To be honest, before coming here, we watched all your documentaries and every <laughs> single documentary on the Black Panthers we could. Um, so in my own quest to find where I belong as a black Oromo Muslim woman um, in Halifax, um, I formed a group at Dalhousie called the Black Indigenous and People of Color Caucus. Um, <laughs> It's known as BIPOCUS, and our mandate is to uplift and support black students as we navigate a very white institution. Um, we use anti-oppressive frameworks to create spaces where we can be our truest and best selves. And so my question for you is what words of wisdom and advice do you have for young students, black, indigenous, and people of color who are wor working to make a change or who want to get involved to make a change? And like what? How should we move forward to deal with issues within our own communities, issues within the greater context of institutions? How do we work to carry on the work that you and the people before us have done to further push our struggle towards equity? Well, you know, thank you so much uh, for that eloquently articulated question. Um, and I say that because I'm not sure whether I have the answer. <laughs> and I don't even know whether I should have the answer. Um, uh, I have learned that knowledge emanates uh, from and is produced uh, in so many places. Uh, and, and certainly um, youth activism um, is important precisely because it produces new knowledges. Uh, and I don't know whether I, as a person who, have, who has now accumulated so many decades of experience, I don't know whether I'm the one who should be giving you advice. Uh, <laughs> uh, because I think that advice might be counterproductive. Um, because it is precisely the role of coming generations uh, to benefit from the experiences and the knowledges produced by generations before them, but also to challenge them, also to move in new directions. And I think that um, oftentimes as we grow older, we become too comfortable in the um, um, position of elder, that we are the ones who are supposed to be um, offering um, advice. And we forget that when we were young, we, although we respected our elders, we had different ideas about how to go about change. And in, in many instances, we had to challenge our elders. Um, and so I'm trying not to be that person. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to remember my younger self. <laughs> and therefore, I try to encourage young people to experiment, to find new ways. Uh, and I find myself learning a great deal from younger activists. Uh, because you are the ones who represent the future. We no longer, people of my age no longer represent the future. And I think we have to come to grips with that. <laughs> Those of us who have white hair in the audience. 
I think there's a microphone to my left. I hope there is. Oh. Um, no? no I there think should be a microphone to the left. Go back to the right, uh, which hopefully will not represent the right necessarily. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> um, my name is Ifoi Kede. I am Isoko from the Niger Delta region. When the British visited us, they decided to call the land Nigeria without asking us what our land was called. Mm -hmm. So I don't recognize it. Um, in the spirit of what you just shared about challenging our elders, I'm reminded of something from Ghana where they talk about Sankofa, the spirit of going back and bringing it forward. So I think your presence and your wisdom is valuable so that those of us who are younger can bring back that wisdom that you have and bring it forward to the present day that we are in. Thank you. So I have a question for you to reflect on a bit, which is on, we know in environmental circles we have institutions that do greenwashing. Um, I believe Dalhousie is doing race washing because this institution is fundamentally anti-black and still is and is actively anti-black. And, and, and we see that in the way the institution protects, cuddles, and babies white, white supremacists in this institution, okay? And we see the way cuddles and babies sexist guys like the, the dental students in, in this institution. Yeah? So my statement for you to reflect on is similar to the tension you had with, with, um, being, with having one of our ancestors on the dollar note, okay? Which is a, an emblem in some way of capitalism. Mm -hmm. So I'm both happy and proud that you're mm -hmm. here, but I'm also concerned at this institution potentially trying to use your image to race wash the white supremacy. <laughs> So my question is, how do we deal with this tension? Or what, or what advice do you have for us to Sankofa into as we deal with institutions that are simultaneously actively violent against us? And then once in a while, like during, I don't know, because I drum, February, they remember that we're Africans and then they want to do celebration, yeah. but then they go back to the regular nonsense. So I'm just wondering about, about that. <laughs> Well, you know, um, institutions have a very long historical memory. And, um, and, 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 and certainly, um, institutions cannot um, divest from the, um, the, the, the racism and other o oppressive um, ideologies and practices that, that, that um, constitute uh, uh, the ground of, uh, of, of their development. Uh, um, but this isn't to say that we simply give up. We don't say, okay, uh, we recognize that this university is racist, uh, so just go on and be as racist as you want to be. <laughs> right. uh, it's our responsibility to engage in those struggles and the responsibility of students, workers, um, administrators, faculty, to try to make this a better place while recognizing, you know, what a difficult process that will be. Um, and recognizing that oftentimes such institutions do uh, try to discover the easy way out, regardless of the thoughts and beliefs of the participants in the institutions. Uh, I mean, that's the, the, the nature of, of structural um, oppression, structural racism, structural homophobia. Uh, uh, and on the other hand, I think it is um, oftentimes um, a major problem among those of us who identify as radical activists, that we believe that, um, that somehow changes should take place overnight. 
uh, that, uh, that, that we demand an end to racism, and racism will fly out of the window. Uh, or, that, or that we can't achieve our announced goals within uh, one year, or within four years, uh, or eight years, or 20 years, or 50 years, or 100 years. And I say this because the process of change is, is very long. And, and oftentimes, we fail to recognize that it's our responsibility to leave traces of our commitment to radical change. <laughs> and therefore, the work at this university will consist precisely in guaranteeing that when those who are activists now are no longer here, that the struggle continues and will continue into the indefinite future. I mean, I think that um, that's the only thing that we can hope for. And I always uh, refer back to Stuart Hall's uh, uh, reminder he said over and over and over, there are no guarantees. There are no guarantees. But nonetheless, we have to act as if it were possible to change the world. What I love about your answers to the questions is that there are more questions in their every answer. <laughs> And that those answers are un unbelievably challenging as well. They're not easy, never easy. And you're, you recognize the fact that it's a long struggle and, and we have that ahead of us. Another question, please. Good evening, Dr. Davis. Um, my name is Masuma Khan and I'm here with my sister, Kate McDonald, and we're here to ask you a question. Uh, but she's given me permission to uh, preface the question. Last year, I made a Facebook post calling out racism, white fragility, colonialism, and this institution. I'm a vice president at the student union and this is my second term. And as I made that post, this university decided to discipline me through the Senate and said that I had violated the code of conduct and a complaint of reverse racism went to Dalhousie's Human Rights and Equity Services and was processed and therefore the Senate proceeded to discipline me uh, stating that I had violated Dalhousie's Student Code of Conduct for calling out um, colonialism, white fragility, and racism. It has not been an easy time to be on this campus. I have had to fought for re-election through fighting and debating white supremacists. I've been racially profiled by Dell security. I've been followed on this campus. I've been harassed every day. I've had to take my story public because the university would not listen to me. I took my story public and received death threats and received messages telling me how to mutilate myself. I've received constant hate constant othering from not only people from across the world, but from this campus, from people who are part of the racialized community that are supposed to be here holding solidarity, but instead I'm being othered constantly and I'm not being included. I do not belong here on Dalhousie and they have made it very clear to me as a student union leader and as a racialized person, as a Pashtun person, as an Afghan woman, as a Muslim woman, as a woman, as my mother's daughter. Our question is how, my, my concern is how are people of this age gonna be able to survive when we face so much violence for speaking up and our institutions don't protect us and they throw us under the bus? How am I supposed to survive? How is the next generation supposed to survive? When white supremacists follow us around campus, they take pictures of us, they dox us on the internet, they take videos of me, they post them, and no one can ask me how I'm doing. 
How, how are we supposed to continue to exist when everyone wants us to be gone? I'm tired of being here on this campus, existing as the other, when I walk into Senate, when I walk into administrator meetings, when I am working with students, I'm tired of first years being told that I'm a terrorist. I'm tired of these sort of experiences and I have to continue with it until I graduate this spring. And I will graduate. <laughs> children survive? Yeah. I, How I think, do we continue? I think I, um, I, think I understand um, the question that you're asking. Of course and, you do. Um, <laughs> and your question brought back many ex of my own personal experiences. Uh, uh, and I, you know, I remember uh, being on the campus at UCLA. I was a professor then, uh, and um, receiving death threats um, every day and, and, and having to be um, guarded by the campus police uh, because they wanted to make sure I wasn't killed on the campus. But but my my answer, um, it's an answer I offer over and over again. Uh, and it's, it's about building community. Um, because of course, if we are alone, there's no way to survive. And during this, 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 this era, which has witnessed the um, ascendance of global capitalism and, and, and um, neoliberal ideologies of, 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 of individualism. When we think of ourselves only in terms of uh, a single person, then there's no future. There's no possibility of survival. We survive through our determination to create community. And I sense determination in your voice because you did say that you will graduate. <laughs> and I, um, but at the same time, it sounded as if you were alone. And I know you're not alone. I know you have comrades and sisters and brothers and people who support you. And we get a glimpse of the future precisely as a collective creation, precisely as a consequence of the collective commitment and determination to keep struggling for justice and equality. And, and you said you're graduating in spring. the spring? I better, yeah. <laughs> My mom was gonna kill and, me if I don't. <laughs> um, I would suggest that you make sure that you leave traces of your own activism to animate future struggles on this campus. Uh, because what you're talking about is not going to be wished away in a moment. It's going to take a long time. And it's going to take the participation of students and, and workers and progressive faculty and everyone on, on this campus. Uh, um, and 
so continue to be a thorn in their side. <laughs> Thank you. I have already been a horrible chairperson in that I have already extended the question period beyond its point of uh, ending. Uh, I'm going to make a, a chair's decision that we'll have two more questions, and I'm, as I say, I'm breaking my own laws, really. But uh, if, if this microphone can, can uh, ask a question, and perhaps these people can decide who will be the last amongst themselves. My, um, my question kind of, thank you so much, Dr. Davis, for being here. I could speak forever about how wonderful you are and how blessed we are to have you. We all know this. Thank you for being here. Um, my question kind of, it goes in line with Masuma and, and Kate, Kate's question in terms of being a clinician, a caregiver, as a person of color. And I'll preface my question by saying, I worked in a medium to maximum male security prison where I ran a medical and psychiatric clinic. And my first day of work at the institution, I realized and I quickly learned that the black inmates, the brothers, were being refused health care. So I pitched a proposal to the institution to try and navigate how I could give equitable care to all people, all of the brothers who were in the institution. And some of the inmates I knew, I knew them from, from the community, I knew some of their family members, and they told me, they said, V, we're, we're thankful for what you're doing, but you need to stop, because they're gonna come for you, and they came for me. And I, I put up with it for a year, I took it for a year, and I never, I tried to not show um, how afraid I was for my own safety, from not being let into the institution in the mornings when I get to work, I'd have to wait for a white person to come to work for me to be let into my workplace. Because as you know, in a prison you need to be buzzed in. Um, from mi many microaggressions like that to um, things I probably shouldn't speak of publicly. But being in a line of work where your work is confidential and traumatic, and you sustain your own trauma, <coughs> While you're helping people resolve their trauma, <laughs> how do you, what does your self-care look like? <laughs> <laughs> and when you do, and when you do need to step away for purposes of self-care, self-preservation, and your safety, yeah. how do you not feel defeated? Well, if you think universities are difficult, oh gosh. Uh, prisons um, it's inhumane. Uh, incorporate um, the, the worst, I mean it's in a sense they've become a refuge for um, those um, oppressions that we have, that we thought we had gotten rid of. Uh, and um, so I thank you for the work that, that you're doing and for your uh, perseverance. Uh, you know, but certainly in situations um, such as the, the one in which you find yourself in, self-care is essential. Self-care is important for all of us. Um, and what is my routine? Um, well, perhaps I shouldn't be talking because I have a cold. <laughs> <laughs> but I, um, over the years, I have um, recognized how important it is to engage in the care of self, uh, uh, something that I didn't necessarily recognize earlier on. Um, you know, I, I often point out that um, when I was in jail myself, I was compelled to develop a kind of repertoire of self-care in order to survive. Uh, um, and um, I took up the practice of meditation. I took up the practice of yoga. That was a long time ago, and I always <laughs> try to point out there weren't even any yoga mats at that time. <laughs> you know, yoga was not an industry in the way that it is now. Um, but, uh, but it really, it really helped me. Um, and now I, I, I understand that, it, that, that ways of um, communicating 
spiritually with others, ways of imagining oneself as a part of a larger community, uh, a larger spiritual community, as well as community of struggle, um, can help to uh, preserve our um, mental, our physical, mental, and spiritual health. I was very fortunate in the 1980s to become involved in an organization uh, that uh, is called the National Black Women's Health Project. I, I was on the board for many years. Uh, so I learned a great deal about uh, how to um, care for uh, the self. But I think what we most need during this era are modes of self care that emphasize community. Because, because too often we assume that self-care is an individual, indeed individualistic uh, mode of being attentive to the physical, spiritual, uh, mental needs uh, of our bodies, our souls, our spirits. Uh, um, but I think we have to discover w ways of, of, of uh, generating collective self-care. And I say this uh, because uh, I've, been, I've learned a great deal from younger activists. Uh, and I, I, I love the way uh, many of the younger groups always begin with rituals uh, uh, that... Uh, uh, that ask people how they're doing, uh, uh, that, that don't try to assume that the activist leaves all of his or her or their problems at the door when they come into the circle of activism. Uh, you know, because we all come, we come with our histories, we come with our unresolved traumas. Uh, yeah. And, and being involved in a struggle to transform the world has to also give us the opportunity of, of, of bringing our traumas uh, as well as our commitments uh, into the circle. So I think that this will be an issue uh, that will be more deeply explored during the coming period. Uh, I know that there are people who have thought about and written about uh, mindfulness and, 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 and social justice, um, but I think, uh, I don't have the answer yet, but I think that the answer is forthcoming. Uh, uh, Thinking of self-care and a sense of community. I'll take that Yes, home absolutely. Well, thank, thank you, you. Thank you so much. Okay. It is with extreme regret I say this is going to have to be the last question. Well, maybe we can do two at the same time. I bow to you I'll for this. Is that right? <laughs> okay. Um, um, <clears throat> good night, Dr. Davis and Mr. Kennedy. Um, it's a historic night here. Um, I, my name's Augusto Jones. Uh, I'm Rocky Jones' son, Joan Jones' oh. son. Wow. Um, yeah. I, um, I, I do want to get to the question. I talked to Elle before, and Elle said everyone comes up and says everything about themselves, and then kind of puts a question in there. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really going to do that. I just wanted to say um, you've been a hero of mine um, since I was a little boy. My mother was the first feminist I've met. Um, and she had pictures of you in the house. And um, my name is Augusto, which means Black Panther. And that is partly because of the work that was being done by yourself and my dad and my mom. And so um, two things I wanted to say before I get to the question about intersectionality. Uh, I just want to say the amount of love I feel in the room tonight when I see my aunts, my sisters, my stepmom, um, Susan Glasgow behind me, her husband was a, a great influence on me. Uh, and when you say it takes a community to build someone, I like to say all of the people that I taught in this room, everyone that is connected to me, that I know, I'm so proud to be an African Nova Scotian tonight. 
Uh, and I just want to, 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 to just say that there's a sense of you being here that means a whole lot to our community. Mm. And that we want to thank you for that. My next, to get to the question on intersectionality, I'm glad that you said that because from seeing the work that my dad did and when he passed away, I sometimes wonder you know, how much was really done and, and, and where we're at, especially in the present circumstances. Uh, with intersectionality, I find myself sitting in rooms trying to be um, around women and supporting their issues, and I find that being a person with male privilege, especially in <coughs> amongst white feminists, I tend to get serious fire from them all the time from sitting in that circle. And I think when we talk intersectionality, I'd like to get your opinion on what do we have to do to sit in spaces of gender privilege, uh, class privilege, race privilege, uh, to be able to make that intersectionality work because I find those are very difficult spaces to be in when you are the person who is of privilege trying to be in a space to um, become a, a support for a group that, that you've oppressed. Can we get, I'm going to try to answer all of the questions as one, so maybe I can hear from you and from you, and then. Hi. Uh, thank you very much yeah. for um, your work and your impact. I know I don't speak just for myself when I say that. You are the reason why we are here. Um, as you know, we live in a time where it is obvious that the systems that are in place to ensure our survival fail black people around the world. Um, as it becomes obvious that the answer to these problems will lie on young people like myself, um, what advice do you have on to, uh, for young activists as we try to navigate and hopefully dismantle these systems? Okay. And then, and then the final. Uh, everybody the, else, you're the, still standing there, so. Okay, maybe if you could make your questions really okay. short. Short. Uh, <laughs> good evening, Dr. Davies. First, I must say, uh, over the years, I've been a great admirer of yours, being one of those uh, Black Panther admirers. Um, and I thought it was necessary for me to speak because I'm from one of the oldest black communities in Nova Scotia, and I haven't heard anything to, tonight being said about us from the Preston area. Us, us, the, us indigenous black Nova Scotians who have been here, Preston. The pre, nothing has been said is that we don't exist sometimes. Even I graduated from Dalhousie University with my master's degree in the 1970s when there were very few of us walking on this campus. And it was racism that I should be writing a book about. But I'm gonna leave that there now and go to us as the black Nova Scotians who've been here for a very, very long time. And it seems like our issues are silent. I'm listening to everybody else's, but little do people realize so many steps have been done in the 60s and 70s to even allow any black people to be successful in this province. Um, racism, I, got, I'm, I have a lot more to say, but I'm gonna shorten it. Racism is so deeply entrenched in this province, and I as an elder, even though I may not look it, <laughs> 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 but Having been among the first black Nova Scotians from my community to even graduate or enter this University of Dalhousie, and I wasn't in TYP, I'm not trying to, but everybody thought everybody had to be. Some of us were academic when we came. But getting to the point, um, racism is so deeply entrenched in this province, but it's glossed over. And this university is one of them. Everything looked so nice. Um, and in Nova Scotia, our problem that we face as indigenous black Nova Scotian from my area, there's no activist group to help us when we get in any kind of racial situation. And I know because my family have been very academic and the first group of blacks to go through, we've run into so many roadblocks. It's the one that most of us are even still living. And those, I see the pain on people's faces here so they know what I'm talking about. What I want to know, and we fought many, many battles. We fought 
Dalhousie University. We fought I Royal Bank. We fought uh, the Children's Hospital. We fought the Halifax Regional School Board. This is one family with hardly no social activist group to uh, support us. So it wears people down. What I want to seek from you, Dr. Davis, and I even will call you your honor. That's how much respect I have for you. I was, I was looking for my book on the Solar Brothers downstairs tonight <laughs> to bring it for you to sign, but I couldn't find the book, much to my regret. But what I want to ask of you is, and even in our family now, we're fighting a racial situation against an institution, much like this school. What do we do when we find ourselves up against an institution that has all the lawyers and all the supports and we're alone? What do we do to even keep going? I, I don't know if there's a direct answer, but I want you to know that as a black indigenous Nova Scotia, particularly from the Preston area, I mean, I'm a retired high school teacher, so kids talk to me. I hear it every day. What, what, what do I tell those children when they go and they work in the bank and they know they're being treated unfairly and they're either forced to resign or get fired? They have to resign. So, so how do we fight this alone? It's a problem here, and it hasn't been said tonight, the housing needs to know it, and I'm saying it for institutions in Nova Scotia, from school boards to hospitals to courts. <laughs> We're being too nice. And I'm an elder on my way out, so I'm, I don't have all the energy anymore. So, I mean, what, what, do you give, what advice do you give to the young people who find themselves, who went to school for so many years and are being dismissed, forced to retire from their job and have to leave the province? It's painful. I stood in line because I felt people had to hear it tonight. We're the people who've been here 200 years, and I don't see too much change. <laughs> I think there are two more questions there, and, and Dr. Davis has generously agreed to try to answer all of these questions okay. at once. I'd just like to say thank you so much for coming here tonight, uh, Dr. Angela Davis. Um, so I guess I'm just going to try to adjust this quickly. <laughs> I'm a little too tall for this. Um, so, essentially, I am of Caribbean and Canadian descent. Uh, my father is Bajan, and my mother is uh, from PEI. And so I grew up in Prince Edward Island myself, which is predominantly white, and uh, I struggled with that quite a bit. Um, so at this point in my life, uh, now living in Halifax, and before that, I lived in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, uh, New Brunswick, uh, other places that were, you know, 98% white people, and <laughs> had to grow up with with uh, not being able to essentially fit into what people's ideology of what I should be based on stereotypes. Um, and I was wondering now that I'm at a point in my life where I'm going through a lot of self-discovery due to the way people have treated me. I was just kind of curious what kind of words you would have or suggestions for people who, you know, spent uh, 20 plus years of their life um, not knowing who they were because uh, they're separated from a part of their self uh, like my father has never really been around, so I, ha I don't know that part of my family. But, you know, I want to do everything I can for all people of color and to be able to hear people's stories and share my own. And I'm just kind of wondering, you know, what you would, what would be your main suggestion for someone that stands in my shoes because I'm sure that there are many people, maybe even in this room, that can relate to this uh, isolation. Uh, 
I, the line seems to be getting longer, I'm afraid. Can, can we, the last question here then? Um, hi, Dr. Davis. I'd just like to thank you and say what an honor it's been to be, have the opportunity to be present here tonight and hear you speak. Um, it was very moving to hear you talk about uh, Brazilian's presidential candidate, Jair Bolsonaro. I'm from Brazil, and uh, right now I'm feeling particularly upset and distressed with the political situation in my country. So my question to you would be, how can people like me and uh, the other people from Brazil who actively oppose Bolsonaro influence the people who are blind to their own privilege and blind to how these prejudices and aggression are a great danger to our society. <laughs> if it's very brief. Well, um, you know, thank, uh, thank all of you who have uh, posed questions during this um, final segment of uh, our evening. Uh, and um, uh, first, um, August Jones, um, I'm very happy to, to have um, met you. Uh, I have followed and admired the work of your uh, father and, and mother, and I'm so um, um, really inspired to hear you struggling with uh, the, the question of um, how to enact um, a kind of intersectionality within the context of being um, um, identified uh, as uh, a person with uh, male privilege. And I know we, we've talk, we talk a lot about privilege these days. Um, and I could do a whole lecture on that, and I'm, <laughs> I'm just trying to think of... Uh, um, but I think we should also talk about commitment. Because too often we are um, saddled with what is assumed uh, to be uh, the consequence of one's identity. Um, and it seems to me that uh, people who are gendered as male have a major responsibility to address issues that unfortunately are too often assumed to be only um, women's issues. Um, gender violence. Intimate violence sexual violence, we're never going to be able to imagine a world that has been purged of these violences until there is a vast movement of conscious people who identify as male. I mean, it's a male problem. And, 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 and so I, um, I would hope that you recognize that there is so much important work to be done. Uh, as a matter of fact, when the women's movements, the movement against rape and sexual assault emerged in the 1970s, uh, uh, you know, many of us were hoping that soon uh, there would be a movement of conscious men. 
And some groups emerged, Men Against Rape, for example, in Washington, D.C. in the early 80s. And when I saw that group, I said, this, this is a harbinger of what is to come. So I imagined that there would be groups of men against rape developing all over, uh, all over the U.S. and Canada and other parts of the world. And that didn't really happen. Um, but I think now we recognize that uh, these issues are structural. They're not just issues that are, um, that are created by individual males. And, and so it's going to take all of us to figure out how to purge our world of, 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 of these ideas. And it's going to take an inter, intersectional perspective to recognize uh, that, uh, for example, gun violence in the US. I mean, you all don't have the same uh, problem, uh, but you're not immune from it. Uh, uh, but gun violence is um, a feminist issue. And feminists are not only gendered as female. Feminism is an approach, a methodology, a way of understanding the world, a way of challenging many forms of oppression. And so I, 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 I hope uh, that uh, you will continue in, in, in that vein uh, and recognize that uh, uh, that most of us have relative privilege. I mean, I could sp spend the whole time talking about the ways in which I'm privileged, right? And while I think it's important to be aware of, 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 of the, the ways in which we have been shaped by um, social institutions and ideology, it is perhaps even more important to embrace a kind of commitment to radical change. Uh, and that is how we build communities that will move us in that direction. And so that is um, the advice that I would give to um, uh, uh, the young man uh, who asked the, the question. Yes, yes. Uh, I, you know, as I said before, I'm reluctant to be the purveyor of uh, advice um, because I, I know that um, those who really bring about change during the coming period will use other methods and we'll have uh, deeper analyses. Uh, and l let me just give you an example. And this is also um, in answer to the question about um, the, the, the question about advice that was offered here. Um, the, the, the second person who asked uh, how I would advise uh, young, young people. Um, and the, the example that I, I often like to give is that we really transform in the way we understand police violence. Now it used to be that we focus only on the individual perpetrator of racist violence. Uh, and maybe not all of us, maybe you know, some of us um, uh, understood the structural character of, of that violence, but in general our activism focused on bringing the individual person uh, to uh, the individual cop to justice. And I can give you case after case after case after case after case in which that happened. Yet, yet, no police department was ever purged of its propensity toward racist violence by simply calling for uh, the uh, calling for a single person to be made accountable. So we now understand how structural it is and how deeply entrenched. And, and as I said before, in other institutions where people all identify as non-racist or anti-racist even, the institution remains 
deeply racist. The apparatus remains racist. Uh, and so now I think that young people have recognized that we have to find ways of addressing uh, the apparatus. And for example, um, in, in the case of the campaign against uh, police violence um, in, in the US in particular, Ferguson, which happened four years ago, was a, a moment in which people recognized that rather than simply calling for the killer uh, 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 of, um, of, of Michael, um, what was his name, Michael uh, Brown, Michael Brown to be brought to justice, that, that, there was a, that there had to be a call for the demilitarization of the police because the apparatus itself was um, complicit not only in the shooting of young black people and other people of color, but it was involved in a network uh, that was Islamophobic, uh, that uh, um, uh, called for the training of, of small local police departments in a military fashion. And if you remember those photographs we saw of the Ferguson police initially, they were wearing military garb, they had military weapons, they had tanks. And so this awareness of the role that a country like the state of Israel played in training local police in counterinsurgency strategies and tactics meant that addressing racism in a small local community against young men, primarily men of color, also had to take up the question of militarization, also had to take up the question of, of, of the ideological role of the, of, the, of the war against terror, also had to take up uh, the question of Islamophobia. And so you see that, that there's a much more complex awareness of what will have to be done to bring about these changes. Uh, and young people are responsible for developing that approach. And that's, you know, that's what we mean by intersectionality. It's, you know, not, <coughs> excuse me, not simplifying our perspectives, but complexifying, <laughs> if you want to use that term. Uh, now, ooh, uh, two, two, three, three more comments. Um, I really appreciated the comments of the, the woman who talked about uh, being a part of the oldest black community and how, in a sense, I, I, you know, I heard, I heard in your question, I heard, your, I heard you saying that on the one hand, so much has changed, but on the other hand, absolutely nothing has changed. Uh, because you were uh, talking about you know, what it meant to be a black student on this campus uh, a, a couple of generations ago. Uh, you said you were an elder, although you didn't look it. Uh, but, uh, so I assume that that uh, means that you were here several generations ago. Uh, 19, 1970s, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and so it's true. Um, that so much has changed, and at the same time, so little has changed. I mean, so much has changed, uh, it would probably have been impossible to imagine a gathering like this in the 1970s. Am I right? But then, on the other hand, the issues of structural racism continue to plague this institution. Uh, and my my approach is that, um, first of all, we have to learn how to celebrate our victories. Uh, even the small ones. 
even the minor changes, because we, we can recognize they would not have happened had people not come together and struggled. And so therefore, we need evidence that our activism can indeed make a difference in, in the world. So we celebrate our small victories while recognizing that it may take a very long time uh, to win the larger victories that we want. And in the process of struggling for those larger victories, we will probably be, become aware of more and more issues. I mean, for example, this evening, with the exception of the person who asked uh, the question referring to uh, um, greenwashing, we haven't said very much at all about environmental issues. And certainly, environmental justice is ground zero of social justice. I mean, how many more hurricanes do we have to have before we acknowledge the effects of global warming? Uh, well, anyway, I, I should. <laughs> you know who I'm, who I'm talking to when I say it uh, with that kind of uh, inflection. Uh, um, but in, in, in the process, we become aware of so many issues that we hadn't imagined in the first place. Uh, and, you know, I always point out that when I first became involved in the struggle for black liberation, black liberation was primarily about black men's liberation. You know, our slogan was free the black man. And it was mostly women out there <laughs> <laughs> doing that work. <clears throat> and, so, and so it's a process. And I, I, I think that um, the kind of, our temporalities have to expand. We have to recognize uh, that it is necessary for us to do the work, as I said before, that will allow the next generation, whether you're talking about the next generation of students on this campus, generations are very short in places like this, uh, or uh, the next uh, 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 generation of activists more broadly. But if we do the work um, that um, plants the seeds, uh, that allows for the um, indefinite um, continuity of our struggles for justice, then a change will come. And I'll conclude by um, uh, saying that, um, that let's be attentive to, uh, oh no, I, I, before I conclude, let me just say that Bolsonaro, yeah, uh, I think that uh, International solidarity is really needed for, you know, Brazil, there was a moment when Brazil was our beacon of light. It was, you know, I, 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 I thought about Brazil as the new South Africa. You remember when South Africa represented the hope of people all over the world? Well, Brazil was that, that place uh, and, and still could be particularly because of the activism of black women in Brazil. You know, black women have taken the, the lead in all kinds of social uh, justice movements, and that was the significance um, of, of the assassination of Mirielle um, Franco uh, last uh, spring. And so, um, yeah, um, uh, you know, try to build, while you're here, try to build uh, solidarity. And, 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 and let's talk about Brazil. You know, Brazil has the largest black population outside of uh, the continent of Africa. Uh, and those of us who are interested in the plight of people of African descent have to be interested in Brazil. Uh, uh, because um, it may represent the future. And so as I was, um, I, I was trying to conclude before by saying that let us remember that uh, people 
like um, Viola Desmond, uh, who engaged in that courageous act in the 1960s, and uh, people before her, uh, uh, people who escaped slavery and, 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 and made it uh, to uh, this place, uh, people who were struggling against slavery, and imagine a better world, imagine a place where we could be free. And in a sense, we are the materializations of their imagination. <laughs> and and if, their, if their work mattered when it did, hundreds of years ago, then our work will matter to those who come after us. And with that, I conclude. Thank you very much. Dr. Angela Davis, everybody, Dr. Angela Davis. My name is Marco Simmons, and I'm a second year law student at Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University. My name is, Kat oh, hmm. <laughs> My name is Katrina Jarvis, and I'm a second year um, social work student at Dalhousie University here. Ooh. We are thrilled to have you here tonight, Dr. Davis. And you have given us so much to reflect and to consider. Um, on behalf of the Housing University, it is our pleasure to present to you this gift. This is a blanket that has been made from the wool of sheep at the Faculty of Agriculture located in Truro, Nova Scotia. One of our many historical African Nova Scotian communities. Please accept on our behalf. Now I'd like to conclude the night. Thank you all for, this, for joining us this evening um, for Dalhousie's 200 celebration. And everyone is invited to the reception outside the auditorium. And finally, join me again, one last time, in thanking Dr. Davis, Dalhousie's new, Dalhousie University's newest honorary degree recipient. Have a good night, everybody.